and Barry. Hey, my friend. Hey, Ben. Good to see you again, brother. How's it going? It is going well. Here's where I'll start the conversation. So we had our mutual friend, Dr. Bickman, on here on Thursday, uh, on Wednesday. And I asked, I shared a quote with him and I wanted to get his thoughts on the quote. I want to share the same quote with you and get your thoughts. So it came from a gentleman named, named Eric Hoffer. And he said, in times of change, the learners will inherit the earth while the learned will find themselves beautifully equipped to deal with the world that no longer exists. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Yeah, that's a, that, that is a beautiful quote. And I think, I think that's exactly accurate. And uh, the, the learned, they think they know so many things that they don't actually know. Right. And our, uh, all of our good friends, uh, Donald Rumsfeld said, uh, uh, God, a couple of decades back now, there are things we know. There are things we don't know. There are things that we don't know we don't know. But, and there's also things that we think we know that are, in fact, false. And that, in my opinion, the, that's probably the most dangerous fact of all is the thing that you know, by God, this is true. There's no doubt about this when, in fact, you're exactly wrong about that. I think that's if not the most dangerous, one of the most dangerous ways that we can delude ourselves and ultimately harm ourselves, both as a species uh, and and as a group, as a tribe, as a whatever you want to call it, I think that's a very, very dangerous place to be. It's also, you tend to be quite arrogant and quite dismissive if you think you know beyond all shadow of a doubt. And uh, one of the things I love about this community that you and I are members of is that uh, Professor Bickman's, and he is an excellent example of this. Even if it's something that we literally think we know, he and I both, if we see some fact that's contrary to what we think we know, we're both back immediately in student mode. Like, wait a minute, huh, that's weird. Let me, let's look, let's think about this. Do we really know what we thought we knew or were we wrong about that? That's powerful. And people, people, some people see that, especially the learned, they see that as a sign of weakness. Like, oh, you're not towing the party line. But in my mind, that's a sign of, of intellectual strength, of, of, of character. Uh, and also, I think it's, a, it's a, one of the traits to be ultimately victorious mm -hmm. in this battle and in life in general is to always be immediately willing and able to go back into student mode and go, wait a minute. It doesn't make sense with what I think I currently know. So let me, let's think about this with a fresh brain and look at this with fresh eyes. And let's go back and look at that research that we thought proved something that maybe in reality didn't prove anything. And maybe we just misread it. Maybe our filter spun it the wrong way. Maybe our paradigm just wouldn't let us see the actual truth. We saw what we thought was the truth. And I love that. I love that quotes and I love Bickman because he, he's so good at that. He and I both are like 12 year old kids uh, that's just, you know, got a new science project. We're like, oh, wait a minute. Let's let's reexamine everything. And I think that's a, that's a very powerful place to live your life. Yeah, I see that with you and with Dr. Bickman. It's why, you know, so many people are attracted to your work and you're changing so many lives. And that's that's the name of the game. Adaptability in, in your thinking in your approach. Uh, so based off of that, let's, let's, let me ask you the next question. What's one thing maybe four years ago in regards to keto that you were, you really believed in and then you changed your mind to this day? Yeah, several things actually. Uh, uh, I was a huge fan of and proponent of uh, probiotics when I first started doing this thing that I do. And uh, just assuming, you know, I'd read three or four books and 20 or 30 research papers. And I just assumed that I understood that. And the more that I, I followed that body of literature, the more I realized we don't know a damn thing currently about our gut bacteria. And you were just talking about a study. Uh, and, and you can probably you probably remember when we were talking about, oh, if you're colonized with Formicates versus Bacteroides, that's a huge deal. And then, if you've got one, you're going to be sl slender and healthy. If you've got the other, you're going to be obese. And, and now it's like, uh, yeah, that literally is like uh, touching the side of a house and saying, oh, this is the Grand Canyon. Just based on that one tiny touch, you have your no, you have no idea. We, we literally currently are complete idiots when it comes 
to the, the gut microbiome, both what it is, what it should be, what you want it to be, what you want to not have. And then also uh, any manipulation of the gut microbiome currently is a literal shot in the dark. And so if anybody is trying to sell probiotics and say, oh, this will lead to this or improve this, no, I'm sorry. Maybe, maybe, but but literally no research supports anything that anybody has to say if they're selling a probiotic product. Uh, no, no. And that's just one thing. Another thing is I truly believed <clears throat> that there were magical phytonutrients in plants. When I first started low carb, paleo, carnivore or keto, I truly, truly thought that you, if you're not eating vegetables, you're dumb because there's magic stuff in there we haven't even discovered yet, not to count, not to mention all the magical phytonutrients. And now as I have went back multiple times to the, the literature and looked with fresh eyes and, and with a slightly shifted paradigm uh, over and over again, I'm like, yeah, no, mm -mm, sorry. And so one of my, one of my biggest videos on YouTube is the seven low carb veggies you need to eat every day. And it's got, I don't know, two or 3 million views. And I had to, I went back and actually changed the description of that video. And I'm like, if you're a keto, a beginner, yes, then I, I still effectively agree because I think vegetables are a gateway for many, many people uh, to get to a, a low carb diet that is really optimal for them. But I don't think the majority of us need, you know, seven to 10 cups of salad or, or lots and lots of vegetables. I don't even think currently, I don't think the average human I don't think the majority of their plate needs to be covered with vegetables or plants of any kind at this point. I think the majority, the over at least 50 to 99.9% .9 of your plate should be covered with fatty meat and eggs with the yolk. And if you want to add some, some, some veg, some berries, some nuts, I think that's probably fine for most of us, not all of us. Uh, but the more I do this, the less in love with vegetables I am. That's just two examples. I can keep going. <laughs> and I love that you changed the description in that video. The probiotic thing I see all the time. When I ask people, hey, what supplements do you take? There's always like four. Um, a vitamin D without the other fat-soluble vitamins, a synthetic multivitamin, the same probiotic they've been using for so many years, creating probably like a monoculture possibly, and then fish oil, which is usually a rancid fish oil. So what and, and we talked a little bit about how fasting, and I was getting into fasting before you got in here. How does fasting play into this conversation of the gut microbiome? Well, I think it's <clears throat> hugely powerful. Again, uh, uh, both of us have to admit we're, we're, this is pontification. This is how we're hypothesizing here. But uh, if you apply the, the following filters, and the, these are the filters I apply to every conversation, every uh, fact that I hear every hypothesis that someone says, I, you know, I think this, I say, first of all, does this make good common sense? Number two, is there meaningful research to support this? And then number three, does it make sense through a lens of evolution or through an ancestrally appropriate, right? And so if you don't apply all three of those filters to what you're talking about, you can quickly, quickly get off in the weeds and be, be saying some dumb shit and not even realize it. And especially if you're still under the current paradigm that all things modern are by definition better, that all anything invented by, by scientists is 100 percent. That's it. That's the best there is. Uh, and basically ignoring the millions upon millions of years that this 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 DNA carrying body has been evolving. Right. And so when you when you apply those filters to fat to fasting right off the bat, you're faced with the inarguable fact that human beings have been fasting for millions of years. So anyone who says, oh, you need to only fast with the, you know, work with a, a doctor. That's dumb. That'd be like saying you only need to breathe, uh, you know, with the help of your pulmonologist. We've been doing that for a long damn time. I don't think I need to consult my my pulmonologist. That's a lung specialist before I breathe. I think I can. I think my brainstem has got that. Same goes for urine output. Do I need to consult my nephrologist before I go pee? I don't. I don't. I don't think so. I, I don't think we need any modern 
uh, input. No modern opinions are needed for these body functions that are literally ancient beyond definition or understanding. Yeah. yeah. And fasting is one of those. And so uh, fasting, if you fast for long enough, that's called starving. And if you do it long enough, you'll die. That is hundred percent true. But a, a one day, two day, three day, I think probably up to a five or seven day fast for most of us, there is literally zero percent danger from that first and foremost, because we've been doing it for so long that we've, our body's actually co-opted that. Uh, I don't want to call it a process. Let's call it an absence of processes because you haven't done it, eaten anything. Our body has learned to use that as a healing uh, period and a, and a rejuvenation and a regrowth and a rebuilding phase. Uh, much like here in central Florida in the off season, that's when all the cranes are out. That's when all the maintenance men come in. That's when all the stuff happens here. You don't do that during the busy season. That'd be dumb. You do that during the off season and you can look at fasting as the off season of eating. And so that's the perfect time for your body to come in through autophagy, mitophagy, uh, and, and fighting the inflammation, lowering chronic inappropriate inflammation and all those other things. That's the perfect time for your body to do that. And indeed, when we do meaningful research, we see that that's exactly what's happening. And uh, fasting has not got nearly the research that it needs. And most of your listeners will know immediately why over the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years is because there's not a there's not a patent at the end of that research product, right? A process. Nobody's going to be able to patent fasting. Yeah. Nobody's going to be able to come up with a pill or an injection or an infusion that the FDA can approve and then they can boom, bang, they, you know, their university just made a billion dollars and they got a, a $800,000 kickback. That's never going to happen with fasting. So in our current uh, research atmosphere, and I think uh, Professor Bickman would echo this, you're never going to have any huge, meaningful study done about fasting because no, no one's really interested because there's no millions or billions to be made. So there's no funding for that. And so then since there's very little meaningful research we have to go back to my other two filters, which are common sense. How have, is this a new thing? Is this some new discovery? And then the, the the evolutionary lens or the ancestral appropriateness of this. Have we been doing this a long damn time? Yeah, we've been doing it just as long as we've been breathing yeah. and making yeah. urine and sleeping, right? And all and our hearts been beating just as long as we've been fasting. So you, it, it's idiotic to pretend that fasting is new or it's a fad or it's maybe dangerous, we don't know, we need more research. Uh, all that falls away is just foolish, you know, sophomoric childhood blabber. That's what it winds up being. When you look at all this with the proper paradigm, which means you're applying those three lenses to look at this, this hypothesis that, that uh, of fasting. And so I think the gut microbiome, what, what me and, thousands of other people who have reached out to me have noticed with, with, with low carb, keto, ketovore, carnivore, lion, any of those diets. And you know, as well as I do, when you start eating a diet, that's, that's very rich in healthy protein and healthy fat, you just automatically, you don't eat as often. You don't have to snack. And so you, you effortlessly in, in many cases, unconsciously, you just start to do some daily intermittent fasting and you may not even know that's what it's called. And then uh, before long, you're like, man, I, I think I'm going to do a 24 hour fast. Mm -hmm. If for no other reason, just to, to add that to my notch and say, yeah, I've done that. That's no big deal. I, I'm, I'm tough. I'm, you know, I'm, 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 I'm resilient. I'm anti-fragile. I, I don't have to eat every day. That's dumb. And so, but we see that our gut bacteria, when we do send it off for testing, which there's a thousand problems with that as well, as you know, uh, it looks like our, our gut bacteria becomes more diverse and it becomes healthier. And, and with almost without exception, I get feedback from keto, ketovore, carnivore people. It's like, man, my, my gut is happier than it's ever been. Uh, and my, my bowel movements are literally a non-issue now. Um, I don't have to worry about any of that anymore. It just kind of happens effortlessly as it should. Much the same way breathing and, and your heart beating and urine output happens. You don't have to track that. You don't have to do anything. It just happens. And I think that's the way it should be. And so I think that when we do start to do meaningful research on fasting 
and the the microbiome, I think we're going to see uniformly across the board that that you're going to downregulate gas forming uh, bacteria and fungi and viruses. Right? We have all that in our in our gut. It's not just bacteria. Bacteria probably play the largest role. We don't even know that for sure yet because right, there's definitely right. fungi, there's definitely viruses, and we have especially examples in other species where fungi can literally hijack not just your gut; they can hijack the entire organism and make it do things that are exactly contrary to it living. Right? There's there's the zombie ants. There's tons of YouTube videos. There's cockroaches. That can be their entire system be hijacked by this fungus. And it makes them go and do things that are just insane from the ant's perspective. And so you know that not only has that fungus hijacked the, 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 the ant's body, but also its mind as well. And so uh, I think uh, this is one of the reasons a lot of people notice that the sugar addiction, the carb addiction, all that kind of stuff, the food addiction, the, the, the disordered eating. Perhaps that is just a consequence of having a very unhealthy gut microbiome from decades of eating a highly processed, high carbohydrate, factory made diet. Maybe that encourages the wrong bacteria, fungus, virus. And they're actually using the vagus nerve and other pathways to literally zombify you and make you just sit on the couch and eat more jelly donuts. But we don't know that for a fact, but that makes a lot of sense when we look at other species in the animal kingdom. Yeah, this is yeah, perfect. perfect. Because, oh, you're, there's an echo. Okay, I think it's better now. This is perfect because before you got on here, I was just I was just showing everybody the connection between the gut and the brain. And I was showing a study that 21% of uh, IBD cases are linked to depression, right? So that vagus nerve, whatever happens here, happens here and vice versa. And to your point, fasting has been tremendous for my gut microbiome, so many of those on here. And I just feel so good. It's give, you're giving your digestive system some time to repair and to recover for the first time in a very long time, especially if you're eating every two to three hours. So intermittent fasting is very, very important. Here's what I want to take the conversation to. For those watching um, and for those VIP members, we're going to have an opportunity towards the 45 minute mark of the interview for you all to come on here and ask Dr. Barry your questions. I'm also going to bring on in a little bit a gentleman that I want you to meet named Triple J. He shared a great story. He's a student in my academy about reversing his type 2 diabetes. So before I get to that, let's talk about inflammation. I want to, I want the challenge members to understand the role of inflammation in the body, chronic versus acute and how keto could help. And then what are some hidden triggers on keto that could hurt? Yep. So there are roughly two different kinds of inflammation that you can think about in a meaningful way. There's acute inflammation, which comes on suddenly and serves very specific roles. And then there's chronic inappropriate inflammation. And that's that, that's not 100 percent true, but that's that's a good way to think about this. So a couple of years back, I made a, uh, a YouTube video about rice, rest, ice, compression, elevation, and yeah, anti-inflammatories, because yeah. that's any physical therapist, any orthopedic surgeon, if you sprain an ankle, twist a knee, tweak your, your shoulder, rest, ice, compression, elevation, anti-inflammatories. That's literally what any healthcare provider is going to tell you to do. Uh, but but first of all, this, let's put our three lenses on that, right? Does that make common sense? Well, maybe. What about the past? What about 100,000 years ago? Is that what we did? Did we, did we go, you know, run up to the Arctic and stick our eye, our elbow in the snow if, if, if we twisted it? Of course not. Uh, now let's look at the physiology of this. What does your body do when you tweak a joint or when you have an acute injury? It causes redness, swelling, pain, right? Edema, that's it. It literally makes those things happen. The injury doesn't make those things happen. The four cardinal signs of inflammation. Your body does that on purpose. And so if you get a big cut on your arm or you tweak your shoulder, immediately it increases the blood supply and it sends all kinds of inflammatory particles, uh, uh, single, single molecules and then entire big amino acids and proteins as well to that area to cause redness, to cause pain, to cause swelling to cause you to not move that shoulder so much, right? That does that for a reason. 
the inflammation that comes after an uh, acute injury. That is the first step of the healing process. Yeah. Yeah. And so why would you want to to cripple that? Why would you want to take an anti-inflammatory? Why would you want to ice down this, this, this joint? Think about that for a second. Why would you do that? You're literally fighting against what your body is trying to do as the first step in the healing process. That's similar. And I got similar to antioxidants. Uh, that's similar to taking antioxidants during a workout or after a workout, right? Yeah, exactly. And so, but man, I got so much kickback on that video from physical therapists and, and even orthopedic sure. uh, PAs. They're like, what's wrong with you? This is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And I'm like, well, I'm sorry, but the, the research that does exist is down in the show notes. And it basically shows without exception that if you ice down a joint, not only does it take longer to heal, but you also increase your risk of winding up with chronic mm. disability in that joint, chronic pain in that joint. Uh, and so why would you want to, why wouldn't you let your body just do what it needs to do to fix that? Why would you want to hamper that or interfere with that? Uh, and so now let's talk about chronic inappropriate inflammation. And I think we need to say it that way so that people understand we're talking about a completely different thing. A, a sprained ankle is supposed to be inflamed. That is good. You should be very happy your ankle's swollen up three times its normal size. That's not dangerous. That's not bad. You don't need to ice that down. You need to, to move that ankle as, as pain permits. It's exactly what we did 100,000 years ago. You need to so rest it if that makes it feel better. Uh, but you don't need to, to take a, a cyclooxygenase inhibitor. You don't need to do that. You don't need to block your COX-1 and COX-2 pathways. Those are vital for your body to get the inflammatory things there to start the healing process. Now, chronic inappropriate inflammation is when you have chronic inflammation somewhere that either, number one, your body can't see, number two, it can't get to, or that it's just it, you're, you're constantly putting inflammatory things in your body, and therefore the chronic inappropriate inflammation just persists because you're basically adding a new bit of slow poison every single day to your system. And so that that is the kind of inflammation that keto, ketovore, carnivore just helps more than any pill in the world. And, uh, you know, I see people when they first start this, they're 300, 400, 500 pounds or more. And, and, and so the average weight loss guru would say, well, you need to eat less and move more. But when you when you tell somebody who weighs 500 pounds, you need to move more like literally they don't feel like getting up and going to the bathroom. Mm -hmm because they're so inflamed, they're so miserable, they're so sick, all their joints hurt, all their muscles hurt, because they've been poisoning themselves several times a day, every day for decades. That person cannot move more. Literally, it's, it's, it's uh, the most insensitive thing in the world. If you say that to somebody like that, they, you should just have your, your face slapped because it's a slap in their face to say something like that to them. But also, you've seen this many times, Ben, I'm sure, when somebody does start to lose the weight, yes. But what are they also doing in the background at a cellular level? They're decreasing the chronic inappropriate inflammation in every cell in their body, every joint in their body, every muscle in their body, all the connective tissue and fascia. And all, lo and behold, a few weeks or a few months or sometimes a year or two into this, so they're like, you know what? I feel really good today. I think I'm going to fill in the blank with, with exercise. I'm going to go for a walk. I'm going to go for a bike ride. I'm going to go swimming. I'm going to get out and play with my grandkids for the first time in how many years? Because once you've decreased the chronic inappropriate inflammation, you actually feel like doing what is a natural human activity, which is being active and having fun and going outside and playing. But you can't do that when your entire system is just chronically poisoned with the crap that modern technology and modern factories tell you that is healthy, you should eat lots of that. It's a great explanation for everybody to understand acute versus chronic. And that's exactly what happened with me, the way that you explained it. I started to change my nutrition and the weight started to come off. And then I felt a little bit better to start exercising. And that's exactly what I did 14 years ago without even realizing that was happening. And you're right. When we see a health educator, a personal trainer, a fitness coach, or whoever it is saying, yeah, just exercise more and eat less. It's very easy. That is a huge disservice to that person. And that's a big red flag that we don't focus on the calorie cutting. We focus on reducing cellular inflammation. And you do that with so many of the tools that Dr. Kenberry teaches about. So let's talk about what are some hidden causes 
of inflammation on keto. Let's say somebody's been doing for keto for three months, but their inflammation is still up. What are some hidden things that might be going on? So it's almost certainly not the meat and it's not the eggs, virtually without exception. Now, there are some very rare exceptions, but for 99.9% .9 of people watching this, it's invariably going to turn out to be uh, something in the vegetables that's causing inflammation. It's going to turn out to be something in the nuts that you're eating that you're very sensitive to that's causing the inflammation. It could be even be something in the berries that you're eating. It could be something in the, the, the seven to 10 cups of salad that you, you know, you heard this guru say that you should eat that every day. That could very well be continuing your chronic inappropriate inflammation. And so that's why I love the carnivore diet. If for nothing else, a 90 day elimination diet, a, a 90 day reset to just basically remove any potentially offending agents out of your diet. And then after that 90 days, when you've given the chronic inappropriate inflammation time to calm down and you've given your body a chance to heal, uh, you're going to also be doing some, some, some unconscious intermittent fasting, if, if not more during that 90 days, because it just happens, you can't help it. Then your, then your rate of autophagy, your rate of mitophagy are going to increase. You're going to start replacing old damaged cells and mitochondria and tissues. And before you know it, you're going to feel much better overall. And, it, and it, it, most people describe it as just a, a whole body sense of, man, I feel better. It's, it's not necessarily a certain body part feels better. It's just, I just feel better. And I think a big part of that's mental as well. Don't you, Ben? I think, I think a big part of, of mental illness, of disordered eating, that comes from this chronic inappropriate inflammation. And perhaps our gut bacteria, viruses, and fungi telling us to do inappropriate activities that are not really for our reproduction in long life, they're actually for the bacteria or the virus or the fungus. Uh, but, but I think that that's why the 90-day the beef, butter, bacon, and eggs, like Neil just said in the comments, that kind of thing, then you can start to add back in. Well, let's try some broccoli. Let's see what happens. Let's try some spinach. Let's yeah. try some of those cashews because I freaking love cashews. Same. I do too. But I know that I know for a fact now because I've done the personal experiment multiple times because I keep thinking, well, Ben, maybe it wasn't the cashews because I sure do love them. But then every time I add them back, it's like, shit. Yeah, it was a cashew. Okay. All right. Yeah, exactly. Same goes for cheese for me. Maybe not everybody, but for me, definitely – uh, even real full fat fermented cheese, the hard as a rock, you can throw it to, at somebody and knock them out. Uh, too much of that still causes inflammation. And, what about and, goat, goat and sheep? Are you good with that? Yeah. Yeah, and that's great. So let's let's just go right into dairy because I think that's a very important topic that, that we all need to not only discuss, but think about. Think about this very carefully. So I do think without a doubt for most people, goat and sheep's milk is less inflammatory than the, the average uh, bovine or cow's milk you would get in the grocery. Uh, but now, common sense, right? Less bad does not equal good. You have to come to grips with that. Less bad does not mean good. Uh, a lot of people will misphrase that. They'd be like, well, goat's milk and sheep's milk, that's much better. And I think that's, that's, that's not the right way to say it. Because if you say that, better, that implies, wow, that's good. But I don't think we need to imply that because I think there's a, 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 a in the same vein, I think raw milk, if properly handled, is less inflammatory, and less bad than the homogenized, pasteurized factory milk that you get in, in the supermarket. But that does not make it good. OK, there is no mammal on the planet that drinks milk as an adult unless human beings are involved. Milk is a great source of calories. If you are starving to death, you should drink all the milk you can get your hands on of whatever quality. But if what you're trying to do here is optimize your health to be as physiologically and as mentally young as possible and as uninflamed as possible, then it's highly likely that any part of dairy other than butter or ghee, which are essentially just the fat component of dairy, which I think the fat component is fine for most everybody, but the protein component, the casein, there's, there's, there's lots of research that people are sensitive to the casein that they are sensitive. And that's what goes into cheese, right? That's, that's the part, the way it gets left behind the casein is what goes in to the cheese. And I think for many, many people, including me, it's the casein 
which is just one of the dairy proteins. There's hundreds of them. Uh, and so that's why I think I think dairy for many people, it, it might get you to a certain point along your journey back to good health, but it's not going to get you all the way. And that when I first started Keto Sun, I was smashing some cheese, the Parmesan, uh, the Romano, all of it. I was wearing it out, the goat cheese, the sheep's cheese, and I still love it all. So once again, this is a guy I grew up, I was a milk baby. When I was in high school, I played three sports and I would drink a gallon of 2% milk every single day nice. because I thought that would make me strong and, you know, everything that a 15 year old boy wants to be. But it turns out that's all, that was all dumb. That was just me thinking I knew, but I didn't really know. But now looking back, if I, if I could go back in time and actually say, hey, dummy, mm -mm, no, stop that. Then my acne would have got much better. My dandruff would have got much better. All the little chronic weird things that I hated about my teenage body would have gotten better. But I didn't know that at the time, right? And so I think, I think dairy is the downfall of many people because, yes, cheeses can be super, super low carb. Yes, 100%. Yes, it can be very high fat. Yes, that's true. But keto is more than just macros. Macros matter. Macros are important, but that's it. That's not all there is to it. If that were the case, then you could just eat all the keto cookies, cakes, pies, you know, desserts, drink all the keto shakes and eat all the keto bars and, and just look like uh, Ben does. But you, but you can't do that long term. Now, they might help you initially. Yeah. They're not going to get you to your best health. That's just not that's not how the human body works. You have to eat things that are ancient. You have to you have to honor this body. You have to honor where it came from, honor what got it here. And if you don't do that, you will suffer to the degree to which you dishonor your DNA. Yeah, well said. And for those watching, because we have a combination, there's thousands of people in the challenge. We have a combination of those who are brand new to keto, those who have been doing it for months to years. Just to kind of recap with what, what Dr. Ken Berry said, he's not saying that dairy and vegetables so he's not saying that you should not have dairy and vegetables he's saying if you're new to keto maybe that's a good transition for you to get into more of a healthier lifestyle but eventually there's going to be a point and i agree where you need to upgrade your results you want to upgrade what you're getting so that at that point it might be a good idea to explore okay am i having casein am i having too many uh cashews like ken Berry was having do i still feel optimal or do i still feel a little off and you start to eliminate a few things that's where carnivore could be so terrific. It's the ultimate elimination diet. You do it, and then when you experience those amazing carnivore benefits 60, 90 days in, you could do that experiment. Let me introduce cashews back into the mix. Oh, I got joint pain again. Okay, cashews don't agree with me. But it's so custom to you and your unique needs. Somebody could have those foods and feel really great. Most people probably not. So I hope that kind of unpacks it. Is that fair to kind of yep. summarize that, Ken? Okay. I think that's well said, yeah. Uh, I want to share um, an individual with you. I don't know if you've met before, but his name is uh, Triple J. We call him the champ around here. He's a student in my Keto Camp Academy. We brought him on and, and three other members yesterday that shared incredible testimonials. Uh, this is a guy who, and he'll share his story, but he was able to reverse his type 2 diabetes with discovering ketosis. And I want him to share his story with you in a couple minutes, Triple J, if you could share it in a couple minutes. And I want to hear Ken's thoughts on his story and what he's seen in, in his community with similar stories. So here is the champ, Triple J. Triple J. Hey, Dr. Ken Beard, what's going on? Oh, man, if I if I were any more better, I'd need a special permit. <laughs> Triple J, share in a nutshell your story the last couple of years, the journey you've been on and what keto has done for you. Um, yeah, I'll try to paraphrase it, keep it short. Uh, basically, uh, you know, I grew up like everybody else, you know, we were eating, you know, carbs, you know, how we grew up eating the cereals and the toast and the orange juice, all that in the morning and then grits and all this other stuff and, you know, eating, uh, two starches with your meals and all that. I grew up like that. And, uh, you know, as time went on and I got older, you know, your, your body don't, uh, earn all that is like it used to when you were young, you were young. So I started uh, gaining weight, you know, and then I got married and really started eating, you know, and then on the road eating fast food all the time. And so after I went through a divorce, I became depressed about my divorce and I began to eat even more to like pacify the pain of my loss. And I ended up getting type two diabetes. 
And so I went into denial about it. I said, no, that's not me. I, I can't have diabetes, you know, but I did. And so I went on for 11 years of eating whatever anyway, uh, still doing crazy things. Uh, my blood sugar used to run two, three, four, even 500 at times when I did check it, you know what I'm saying? And um, my A1C for those 11 years would always run 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. They even told me it was unreadable after 14 sometimes. They couldn't even tell me what it was. Um, but uh, uh, one day I woke up, it was a Saturday morning and I'll never forget it. I woke up and I just felt the worst I've ever felt in my life. And I decided that I want to change. Uh, so I reached out to a friend of mine named Marquita Bradford. She was doing this thing called keto. And I was scared off from it a year prior to that because my doctors told me I'm going to die and have a heart attack. I did keto. It's not good for diabetics. They scared me. Um, but I just wanted to try it because she had great results. I said, well, let me just try it. And, you know, my first week of doing keto, uh, my blood sugar that used to be like it was, I was telling you, two and three, four hundred at times, was like dropped to like 160, you know, 150. And I was, I was like, oh, wait a minute. So. I said, let me just stay right here for a minute. And so I stayed there for about six months doing it, doing just, just checking my blood sugar every day, uh, breath, uh, fasting, two hours after breakfast, two hours after lunch, two hours after dinner. I really wanted to see uh, because, you know, the doctors did scare me. It was in the back of my mind. So I kept going. And six months later, we're just doing keto because I wasn't even doing any exercise, just eating, uh, eating more uh, healthy uh proteins and little vegetables here and there. I kind of went to carnivore a little bit. I'm really not a vegetable person. So I was doing carnivore and I started intermittent fasting my second month of uh, keto and I started dropping weight really, like really rapidly. And I didn't understand it at first. But when I went back to the doctor about uh, six months later from the day I started, I put my A1C that was at a 12 at the time to a 5.5. And at that time, I talked to my doctors and they were like, hey, uh, what are you doing? And I, I didn't even say keto. I said, I'm eating whole foods. I'm leaving processed foods alone. I'm leaving sugar alone, the cakes, the cookies, ice cream. I'm leaving all that alone, leaving the sodas alone, just trying to do a little better. Cooking at home. You know, I told them all that. And they were like, OK, well, you're doing that. Just keep doing it. And so as we kept talking, they started talking about my medicine. And I told them, I said, well, I've been doing this uh, with, uh, with just eating, eating the foods. And they were like, what? So you're telling us that this is a natural A1C? And I said, yeah, I'm telling you that. And so they said, well, we're going to take you off your medicine because you're managing it with just the foods that you're eating. And as long as you keep doing that, we won't put you on the medicine again. So they took me off of medicine uh, in that July. And I have been keeping my A1C down by doing keto, doing carnivore, and intermittent fasting. I just got to be doing an 83-hour <laughs> extended fast. I don't know. I was insane. I don't know what's wrong with me. But I did it, and I felt like a superhero when I did it. I really did. Um, so this lifestyle is great. Um, those are the things that I've been doing. I'm, I'm walking. I started out with even do a quarter of a mile without feeling like I was going to have a heart attack on the side of the road. Now I'm able to do three to four miles a day, you know what I'm saying? And I got to give that to the lifestyle because when I was big, like you were saying before, I didn't want to do anything. I didn't want to get off the couch. But now I'm up and I'm walking. I'm going to participate in my first 5 day, and both of you are going to be down at the Keto Orlando Summit. And on the 5th that morning, we will be doing the all the way with Triple J 5K, baby. We're going to be doing it that morning. We ready. We ready, baby. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Two things Triple J said that I think are very important. First of all, did you notice how his doctor phrased what he said? So you're telling me you're managing your type 2 diabetes with the foods that you're eating. Well, wait a minute. What, was Triple J managing his type 2 diabetes with the foods he was eating or had he reversed his type 2 diabetes because he was no longer eating the foods that lead directly to type 2 diabetes. His doctor thought that was part of Triple J's definition. Oh, Triple J is a type 2 diabetic. No, 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 he was not. He never was, never was. He was poisoning himself with high carb, highly processed. Uh, you know, it's it's always meat and three, right, Triple J? You can have your ribs, but you've got to have the beans and you've got to have the cornbread and you've got to have all the other carbs he was, he was making himself 
type two diabetic. It was, it was chronic carbohydrate toxicity syndrome. That's what triple J had. And so when you start to, again, change that paradigm and go, wait a minute, am I thinking about this the right way? And so maybe Triple J woke his doctor up. Maybe he didn't. But I guarantee you that doctor, if they're worth a damn, after they've seen the the 10th Triple J or the 50th Triple J, they're going to go, wait a minute. Dude, I must have, I've got something wrong here because you're not supposed to be able to do this just by changing your food. It's not what I was taught. And so that's very important to don't necessarily think doctors are part of some conspiracy theory or they're just bastards, whatever, you know, they are just people trying to get along, trying to pay the bills, trying to do their their thing, but they are just as able to put on the student hat, but they may not want to, but you, but when enough triple J's have sit in that, in that exam room, they're going to have to put back on the student hat and go, I must've missed some, some somewhere. Let me go back and look at this again. And that's, that's the moment right there. And then also triple J, uh, what was your first, well, how did you first start to learn? You had a friend that said, hey, you need to do this keto. Then what was your very next step? How did you learn about keto? Okay. Uh, it, and this was what was great. Uh, she told me about keto, what she was doing, but she said, I need you to join this group on Clubhouse called Keto for the Soul. And so I had to get a community of people that was doing this lifestyle as well. And when I did, they began to teach me all of the different things about keto and everybody does keto differently. We understand that, but the basic principles of it, I began to learn that. Then I was able to follow that guy over there, you know what I'm saying? Ben Azadi, you know, my, uh, my keto Jedi master, I began to follow him and he began to show you how to really tighten things up and really do it the more, the more effective way. You know, not all these keto snacks and not all these different crazy things people are incorporating in saying they can have. And what was good about my journey, I never was a big keto snack person. And so that helped me a lot. I I cooked my biggest success when I first started was cooking at home, doing that and just following the the principles of uh, protein, uh, healthy fat and, um, uh, you know, things like that. And, you know, doing those things. And when I got to carnivore and started doing uh, intermittent fasting, that was a game changer. And so my doctor, it was two of them. One of them was like, hey, well, we're not going to say you were cured, but we will say you put your type 2 diabetes in remission because you're not in the pre-diabetic range or the diabetic range. And then another doctor come in and said, well, I know you're excited about your numbers, but. And then that's when they were like, you're just managing. And so, you know, so I was like, "Mm." but I know what I I know that those numbers aren't lying. They go from a 12 to dang 5.5. Six months. I mean, that's pretty good, you know. So, yeah, that's yeah, that's that's pretty good, Triple J. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, Triple J. Congratulations, man. Thank you for sharing. Anything else you wanted to share, Ken, before I take off, Triple J? Uh, no. Nah, I tell you what, I'll see you guys uh, in Orlando. I don't know if you're going to run the five K with me or not. You know, I don't know that, but I'll see you guys <laughs> down there. And it was a blessing to be here, and appreciate you guys on this beautiful Saturday. Appreciate you. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much for sharing your story and all you guys that, that how many people do you think, how many lives do you think triple J has influenced and, and saved? He's well, not just, a doctor. He's not a dietitian. Thousands, yeah. Yeah. He's just a dude. He's just a dude out there saying, Hey, I did this. And so can you, here's a book to read. Here's a YouTube video to watch. That's how we're going to change this. Because as I, intimated earlier there's no there's no millions of dollars of research funds there, nobody's going to do the huge definitive keto or carnivore study and uh, you know if, if me and sean baker can raise the money we might but I, we're, you're talking about millions and millions of dollars to do a, a big enough study that will make the harvard school of public health shut the hell up that will make all the you know neil bernard and, and michael gregor and all the vegans in order to make them shut the hell up you're going to have to do a 10 year study with 10,000 people in it that's that's controlled and and literally you they have access to, and and they can just walk around and watch every day to make sure we're not cheating and feeding the people you know uh, some celery juice when when they're not looking that that's the only way they'll ever believe this is real and so I gave up years ago trying to change the powers that be and change the people at the top I don't really give a damn what they believe or what they say or what they do. I just want to help my friends and family get healthier, 
my patients get healthier and people like Triple J. And because once Triple J learns how to do this, guess what? You don't need a PhD or an MD or DO or an MP or a PA. You don't need any initials after your name whatsoever to go to your aunt or your sister or your next door neighbor who you love like family and say, look, you're very unhealthy and your food is what's causing it. Here are the simple changes that you need to make to literally turn your life around. You don't, you, you can just be a, a dude or a chick and you can literally make it part of your life to save people's lives every single day. And I, th- I just love that that's possible with social media. And uh, I hope all you guys are doing at least some degree of that. Yeah. Well said. Exactly. It's going to be conversations like this. That's why it's important to get on these conversations, watch the YouTube video, subscribe to Dr. Kensbury YouTube channel, this podcast, these conversations, because it's, it's a paradigm shift. You're right. The conversations from the conventional wisdom thinks you need something external and looks at the symptoms. But our conversation is the body has what it needs to heal itself. Let's just remove the damn interference and let it heal itself. Yep. So when you have conversations with your friends and family and you talk about this keto diet that you're doing, they'll probably say it's a fad diet. It's, it, there's, it's just new. But the real fad diet, to Dr. Ken's very point, is this, the standard American diet, which he calls the stupid American diet. That has been around for whatever, 40, 50 years. But ketosis is an ancient healing strategy like fasting. It's been around since humans have existed. It's a proper human diet. So that's the sort of education that we start sharing with our friends like Triple J is doing. And uh, you can make a big difference. And Ken Berry inspires you all to do that. You can make a big difference with your story and sharing it all over the place. Yeah. And let's go a step further, Ben. Let's not just say that the standard American diet's fad diet. I totally agree. But let's also go a step further and say, well, what about the American Diabetes Association? What about their recommended diet? Does that diet have lots of, of randomized control research showing that it's safe for long-term human consumption? No, none. What about the American Heart Association's DASH diet? Has that been proven to be safe and effective for long-term use in humans? Mm-hmm. No. What about whole food plant-based? Has that been proven to be, to be safe and effective for long? No, none of this. So none of these diets have the proof that they then turn around and say, well, you need to do long-term studies in keto before you recommend it because we don't know if it's safe or not. Well, where are the long-term studies on the the ADA diet, the AHA diet, the whole whole foods plant-based? Where are the long-term studies showing that you're not going to develop vitamin or mineral deficiencies, that you're not going to develop omega-3 fatty acid deficiencies, certain amino acid deficiencies? There's none. There is no research. And so uh, the the keto diet, ketovore, carnivore, they are just as unresearched as all the other diets that that your doctor actually recommends. You know, that little handout that they give you here, eat like this. There's no research to support that handout. None. No meaningful research whatsoever. And so don't feel like you're doing some weird sciencey. Oh, my God, it's keto. It sounds really weird. No, all you're doing is you're removing all of the modern foods. And let's put that in quotes, modern foods. You're removing all the factory made crap and you're just eating real human food that we've had access to for tens of thousands of years. Right out of the gate, how could that even be dangerous? You're eating foods that we've eaten since before we even started recording history. That can't be dangerous. That has to be good for you. So true. You know, you repeat a lie often enough and it becomes accepted as truth. And that's what's happening with those diets you recommend. And then all you need to do is go to your grocery store and look at the vegetable oils, which we know is inflammatory. And you see that stamp of approval from the American Heart Association. That all, all you got to do is see that. And, you know, it's a big red flag. Last 10 minutes here. I want to do Q&A with the VIP member. So if you're a VIP member and you have uh, you're in the back end studio, I see Neil, Antoinette and Heidi. Turn your camera on if you want to come on here. So I see Neil. Neil, you ready to come on here with Dr. Barry? And then I'll do Ant- <clears throat> So here is Neil Burcham. He's in Asheville, North Carolina. Hey, Neil. Hey there. Hello. Hey. Uh, so I've been ketovore since uh, January of 21 and had a lot of success with it. Intermittent fasting, about a 16-8 pretty much every day. Some extended fasts. And just like Triple J was saying, uh, we all start to get uh, people watching, people seeing, what are you doing? And then the shock value people that hadn't seen you in a while. And so questions I had were, you mentioned about being you know, always getting in that student mode. 
uh, how do you, you mention a lot in your videos and on your Patreon, uh, meaningful research. How do you define meaningful research versus crap yep. research? And how do you, yep. how do you find those so that I, I've had a few people ask me some of the more high end questions. My wife is a nurse, uh, and she can help me with some of that. She's also a post bariatric patient. So I've got a lot in our corner, but for some of the other more weightier questions, again, without getting so far into the weeds and, yep. and without, it was still being relatable. Yep. So in order for research to be meaningful, it needs to be, there needs to be enough participants in the study for it to have power or weight is how the scientists would say it. So you don't want to do a study with three people in it. That, that could just be random noise that you're finding. So you want to have lots of people in the study. That's number one. Number two, you want the study to go on for a long time. So if you did a study with a thousand people, that's, that's a lot of people, but, and you, you did keto versus plant-based, but you just did a two day long study. Obviously that's dumb, right? And, and I'm, I'm using it for effect, but the study has to go on long enough so that we can see any meaningful benefits or meaningful uh, bad things that come from eating a certain way. Thirdly, you have to make sure that the data that you're gleaning is actually real data. And so uh, for, for observational or epidemiological nutrition research, the way that they do it is by uh, administering something called food frequency questionnaires. And it's literally a multiple choice test of questions, anywhere from 30 questions to sometimes up to 100 questions. And they'll ask questions like, how many cups of ribs have you eaten in the last three months? And you're like, well, first of all, I don't measure ribs in cups. Secondly, I don't remember. I don't know. And so and then now many of these studies that the, the plant based people will pound on like this is it. This is the proof. They did a food frequency questionnaire when people entered the study and the study may be 20 years long, which that sounds very powerful and it could be. But they did the food frequency questionnaire at the beginning of the study. They did it again five years later and then they did it again 10 years later. And so there's literally three data points in the whole 20 years. So it really wasn't a, a 30 year study, a 20 year study. It was a three day study because you only got information. And then now let's talk about the validity and the trustworthiness of food frequency questionnaires. If you just uh, do an Internet search about food frequency questionnaires and, and validity, you'll see tons of research that shows that people are unreliable. They can't remember they feel like the, the researcher is going to judge them if they say, yeah, I eat bacon every damn day. What are you going to do about it? They're like, oh, I have bacon occasionally, right? Because they're afraid of judgment. And then finally, you have to control the research in a way that the researchers, the guys performing the study, that you have to protect the study results by controlling or blinding or something so that their preconceived notions don't slip into the research results. And there's tons of research uh, that this absolutely happens if you just do an open label, free for all study, that if the researchers are plant-based, they just believe that in their heart of hearts. And they're very earnest. They're not trying to trick people. They believe that plant-based is best. Their preconceived notions, and then also the preconceived notions of the people in the study, because they're looking at this guy and he's, you know, he's got a broccoli pin on his, his lab coat. And they're like, okay, so I, I need to say I eat lots of broccoli, maybe even not even consciously, just unconsciously. They're like, oh, okay. So I need to not brag about eating bacon three times a day to this guy, or he's not going to like me. All of these laws of human nature. And so then when you wind up with a study that does, and then, so then you have to also always remember that an observational study, an epidemiological st study, all they can show is a possible association. They can never, ever show causation. And, and so we actually used epidemiological research to show that smoking is bad. And what you wound, wound up with was a, was a hazard ratio of 20 or 30 when you compared smokers to non-smokers. But a lot of these, these research studies that they're using to say that bacon's bad for you, processed meat, red meat, et cetera, they would find a hazard ratio of 1.8 or 1.7. So 
So the, the tobacco, the smoking studies, the cigarette studies showed a huge correlation, almost inarguable. Still didn't prove that smoking was bad, but the, the hazard ratio was so high. It's like, dude, smoking causes cancer. I mean, come on. But they're finding these tiny little hazard ratios and then saying, see, I told you bacon causes cancer or red meat or whatever. No, no, it doesn't show anything. It shows a possible weak association. So that's why it's and it, ultimately, Neil, it's not your job to have to understand research and how it's conducted. You should be able, you should be able to trust the researchers to design their studies in such a way that they either showed something or the researchers were honest enough to say, well, we designed this study, but it was kind of a shitty design. And it doesn't really, you know, we got $50,000 from the pomegranate uh, billionaire. And so guess what? Our research study showed that pomegranate juice is magical, but really it was, it was a poorly designed study and it didn't really prove a damn thing, but you know, we, we got a hundred thousand dollar research grant. So we did the study, but Human nature is what it is, Neil. People are going to try to, to make put on their best face. We all do that, right? I made sure that I didn't have a booger right before I went live. I made sure my hair looked decent. I made sure I didn't have a big stain on my shirt. All humans do that. That's normal. But at the same time, when you're about to publish something that literally people are going to accept as nutrition gospel, you should really, really think about, did I really show something here? Or did I just, I spent my $100,000 research grant that I got from the pomegranate billionaire. And now it's like, oh, pomegranate juice, man, boom, look at that. All these uh, these phytonutrients in there. But that happens so commonly that it basically currently you can't prove or disprove anything from the bulk of nutrition research. And it's not Neil's job, but it is Neil's problem. And that's why Neil knows more about <laughs> nutritional research then anybody in his line of work should have to know it is not your fault, but everybody watching this hundred percent, it's your problem. And if you don't take it upon yourself to go, wait a minute, let me, let me look in this. Let me internet search this. Let me learn more about this. Then you will be the person to suffer or someone that you love. That's who will wind up suffering. If you don't do your due diligence, even though it's not technically your, diligence that to have to do you better do it anyway and where do we go to get that due diligence so I, I, think, Dr. Google. I think we are all all of us are lost in the wilderness neil wandering looking for truth and all you can do is is see glimmers of of light here and there and go towards that investigate that and go okay because I, I tell people all the time i think uh, when someone adopts a whole a whole food plant-based diet I'm happy that they did that. That's great because what does that tell us? That tells us that they're they're aware. They know that food matters. They're searching for the right answer. And their body, if they'll listen closely, is going to give them the feedback that they need over the next three months to three years. They're going to get the feedback. And they're going to go, okay, well, I mean, I do feel better on this than I felt on the, you know, the stupid American diet but I feel like I could feel better than this. And in the minute, so I love it when people are searching and looking, but there's really no ultimate credible source currently. There's just, it doesn't exist. And that's why I love the experiments that we all do, right? Ben's got his experiment. Neil's got his, I've got mine. And then we all come together as a tribe and, and human beings are by definition tribal animals. We are carry mammals, tribal mammals. You cannot, if you argue that, just if anybody says that's not true, you can hit the unfollow button right there because they don't know what the hell they're talking about when it comes to this species right here. We are pack animals. We're tribal animals. And so we all come together around the campfire at the end of the day. And that's basically what Ben's group and my Patreon and all the other groups, that's what this is. We're all sitting around the campfire saying, well, I learned that if you jump off the cliff, you break your leg. Okay, everybody, now nobody else has to jump off the cliff to prove that. We are like, oh, shit, don't jump off the cliff. Noted. Okay, now what's the next thing? Well, Ben says if you stick your finger in the fire, it burns. It hurts like, right? You're like, okay, nope, don't do that. So we learn from each other. That's how it's supposed to be. And when you see somebody going off the rails and getting sick like Triple J, you know, 300 pounds, blood sugar 400, you know that ain't right. That's not the right way. So what is the right way? 
And so I think it's just a constant back and forth around the campfire, which is what we're doing right now. That's that's how you ultimately figure out or rediscover what a proper human diet is. And I think that's what we're all doing together here. And I love I love that this is happening in the world right now. I don't think there's a better time for this to be happening. Thank you, Neil, for the question. Thank you, um, Dr. Ken Berry, for the great answer. It's a very important discussion that we're just having right now. Do you have time for a couple more questions? Or you got to sure. go. Yeah. Okay. So, Antoinette, you want to come on here and ask Dr. Ken Berry? She does. She's in New Zealand, and I always say she's living in the future. So she says the future looks bright. Here's her question. Hi there. Um, Hello. I just wanted to. Hi. I wanted to ask a question. Um, my 18-year-old son actually started went on keto at the end of last year, which I'm really grateful for because he got me into it. Um, but he went on it to get rid of nasal allergies. He didn't, he didn't need to lose weight. Yep. Um, and he, at the time he was doing all his own research, he was following Dr. Berg a lot. And um, he lost, he dropped a lot of weight really quite quickly. And yep. um, about five kilos or so, which he didn't need to lose in the first place. And then he started, he actually started to get chest pain. Otherwise, he felt really good. He was, he really wanted to stick with it. And, um, but when he started to get the chest pain, he got a bit worried. So we started putting carbs back in his diet, you know, like potatoes. And he still stays off dairy and he still stays off wheat um, and anything processed. Um, but I just, I just, I was curious as to why he might have got that chest pain. Was he too, could it have been, I don't know, too catabolic or I don't know. I'm an ex coronary care nurse, so I was Probably concerned. not. It's an excellent question. And so uh, Dr. Berg is a huge voice in on the on YouTube and other places. And, and much like the whole foods plant based diet, I think he's a great first step for many, many people. But if you follow what Berg says very closely, he, he tells you to eat tons of carbohydrates a day, tons of vegetables. And, and so if, if your gut is full of seven to 10 cups of salad every day, then you're not going to have room for actual nutrient dense food. And so uh, in all likelihood, uh, your 18 year old probably developed some vitamin or mineral deficiency, maybe even omega three fatty acid deficiency. And also he wasn't able to get the nutrient dense nutrition that he needed. That's why he dropped the weight. Because mm -hmm. eating lots of raw plants, oh, you'll lose weight 100% because you, you, there's no nutrition. It's mm -hmm. just lots of water and fiber, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you were following what Berg, especially what Berg used to talk about a, a few years back, yeah, mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not surprised he lost weight and didn't have a good outcome at all. But it did help you, which I love, that, that you're like, oh, okay, keto, let me look into this. But I think for your son, a much better alternative to, would, would be a fatty meat heavy keto. And forget right. about seven to 10 cups of salad or vegetables a day. That's completely unnecessary. He doesn't need any of that. He needs to be eating as much fatty meat and eggs with the yolk as his plate will hold. And mm. that, that, so that's going to put him in a very deep state of ketosis if he does that. I don't think being in deep ketosis is dangerous in any way for any human on the planet. Okay. Ketosis. Now, ketoacidosis is a whole nother thing. If you're brand new to this, I've got a video about the difference. But I know you, Antoinette, you already know. But some people may not know. There, there's a definite difference between those two things. But uh, I, I, I'm afraid that he was probably still eating a, a very uh, high-carb plant-based diet with just a little bit of meat and a, a, little, a few eggs, but not nearly as much nutrient density as he needed with his high metabolic rate. He needed mm. to be eating tons of fatty meat and lots of eggs with the yolk. And he wasn't doing that. And mm -hmm. I, and so I think uh, Dr. Berg is a, ga a great gateway, a great first step towards a proper human diet. But I think that most of us, as we go along, we kind of outgrow uh, that. And we, we start looking uh, for other sources of information at some point. Yes. Yes. Well, that, that's what led me to Ben and then, I've learned of the other people through Ben. Um, yeah, and I've been trying to guide him towards that. He's still, he downs about four eggs a day now, and he's still having good protein um, size portions on his plate and stuff. And I think he has cut back a little bit on the leafy greens and the veggies, because you're right, he was having a lot of those. Um, yep. 
So do you think, I know it's hard to say over, <laughs> over a call, but the chest pain was probably a vitamin deficiency? Perhaps. Actually, and so my, my, most likely his chest discomfort was completely unrelated to his diet. It's probably something right. else. In completely okay. unrelated. And we'll never know. But mm. since he was doing keto, do you see how keto kind of gets pegged as the villain, even though it, in all likelihood it had nothing to do with his chest pain? He yeah. may have pulled a deep uh, respiratory muscle. He may have had some atypical reflux. Who the heck knows uh, mm. what, what caused that? But I think uh, the truth of the matter probably is, is on his, his much meat heavier diet that he's eating now, he probably doesn't have any chest pain uh, to speak of whatsoever. No, he's got a, he tells me he has a little bit now and again, but, you know, 18-year-old boys, they're in and out of conversations with their mothers. <laughs> yep. Yes, I totally understand. And uh, I can tell we've got, uh, thank you for that, Antoinette, very much. That's a great thank question. You. Thank you, Antoinette. Uh, and we got a, a newbie in the, she's like, wait a minute, no nutrition in plants? Naomi, I totally get it. I understand uh, three years ago, I'd have been right there with you going, what the, who the hell is this guy? There's no nutrition in plants. What? So what we're talking about, Naomi, is nutrient density. And so when you comp compare two ounces of one food versus two ounces of the other, another food, how many vitamins, how many minerals, how much uh, amino acids, how many fatty acids, when you compare two ounces of any meat, even the cheapest supermarket beef you can find, even spam, even uh, what's the cheapest meat you can, the bologna, right? Just the cheap bologna. It is still more nutrient dense than two ounces of the most pristine non-GMO organic vegetable, it, whatever your favorite vegetable is. And you can actually look this up and compare the nutrition density between any, any plant and any animal. The animal food is always more nutrient dense. It, it's literally not even a conversation. It's not even close. The meat always blows the veg away. Every single time. Uh, but you'll learn that as you come, as you see, and there are charts people have done. They've compared blueberries or kale to red meat. And it, the red meat just blows the kale away. It's not even close. But we've been taught our entire life that kale is a superfood. Blueberries, Aussie berry, all these plants are superfoods. When in reality, the ultimate superfood is animal liver. That's the ultimate superfood. There's nothing that even comes close to that. Naomi, but uh, I, I totally understand where you're at right now. But I promise you, as you learn more and more, you're going to be like, uh, yeah, plants are uh, plants are fine for garnish and for seasoning. Uh, and if you love them, you can eat uh, some plants. That's fine. But that's not where you get nutrition. from. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. You'll learn a lot and watch the replays because we talk a lot about this. Um, quick questions, then we'll get you off here to enjoy your, um, Florida with your family. Deborah King, who's a VIP member, says, the most important question I have is my husband, Mike, was diagnosed with prostate cancer. We are getting mixed reviews that he should and not do keto. Some say do vegan. I know this is not medical advice, but I heard cancer, cancer mentioned. Can you do prostate cancer uh, with keto? Should it be differently? What is your take, good or bad? Mm -hmm. Great question. And let's widen up this question even more. And let's say, uh, does keto, and my definition of keto is, a diet full of real whole foods, one ingredient foods, ancestrally appropriate foods, lots of fatty meat and lots of eggs with the yolk, uh, lots of seafood if you like it. That's what keto is. I'm not talking about keto cookies, cakes, pies, shakes, bars, drinks, desserts. That's not real keto. Okay, that's that's big food trying to cash in on keto. Keto is real food that we've been eating for more than 15,000 years. Now, so does a keto diet increase the risk of any cancer or does keto make any cancer get worse? Okay. Uh, and, and also we could also say, does a plant-based diet improve your risk of developing cancer or does it in any way treat any cancer? So the answer for the plant food, plant-based thing is no, there's literally no research that shows that eating a plant-based diet reduces your risk of cancer or Im improves your outcome if you already have cancer. There is literally no research that shows any causative link there whatsoever. Secondly, if you're talking about a very low-carb keto diet, then you're talking about, by definition, lots of, lots of fatty meat, lots of eggs with the yolk. Does that increase your risk of cancer or does it worsen your outcome with cancer? Again, there's no, it doesn't, it doesn't make ancestrally any sense whatsoever. 
because we've been eating that diet for millions of years. Secondly, common sense, like, well, no, duh. How does that make any sense? This is literally a proper human diet. Thirdly, is there any meaningful research? No, there's lots of observational studies that show oh, there might be this weak association between a plant-based diet and, yeah, but no. And so the only thing I would change about the, the kind of the accepted definition of keto for prostate, either BPH, prostatitis, or prostate cancer, is you need to eliminate all the dairy, all of it except for butter or ghee just the fat component in the dairy. Uh, it's quite likely that, that the, the casein and the different whey proteins, they might actually give an inappropriate growth signal to prostate cancer, breast cancer, or some of the other cancers. That may be actually true. We don't know that, but it, that, that, that wouldn't surprise me. And so if you have any kind of prostate, anything, I would eliminate all dairy except for butter and ghee. Otherwise, uh, a ketogenic diet is part of the proper human diet spectrum. And if, if he's still a human being, regardless of his prostate health, then he needs to eat a proper human diet. Great answer. I'll get to the other questions. I'll let you enjoy your day. We, um, I want to just get, tell everybody to go get uh, Lies My Doctor Told Me. It's an amazing book. He's writing a new book called The Proper Human Diet as well. Where else do you want to send them, Ken? Just if you'll go to YouTube, I have over 600 videos there. Uh, whatever medication you're taking, whatever medical condition you suffer from, if you have a question about low carb, keto, ketovore, carnivore, I've got videos about all that. Just go to YouTube and type in Dr. Barry and then whatever term you want to see if I have a video about. If I do, it'll pop up. And then there you go. And then in all my videos, I have the relevant research linked down in the show notes below. I never want you to blindly believe me. I want you to do your own research and see if this makes sense for you. Everybody subscribe to the channel. Also, congratulations on your award um, from the Metabolic Health Summit. Well-deserved and many Thank more you. coming your way, Ken. Grateful to know you. I appreciate you so much. Enjoy Florida. We'll talk very soon. Thank you for joining us today. Ken. Thanks so much, Ben. See you next time. See you.